All right. Uh, my plan here is to get comfortable. Um, uh, to tell a little secret, this was originally uh, pitched to me as a 15-minute talk. And a week or two ago, they, they said, how about 60 minutes? And no speaker is ever going to decline that sort of offer. Um, but so it's, the scope of the talk has changed, uh, which I think you'll appreciate and enjoy. But if it seems like I'm trying to put a lot of things together, know that um, those were the circumstances I was kind of operating under. So um, who am I? And I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my, my background, uh, both professionally and personally. And hopefully it doesn't come across as vanity, but hopefully it comes across more as uh, a lot of the, my work and employment history is very relevant to the Seed Center model. And so um, if I've done my job at the end of this, all of these kind of seemingly different areas of conversation will all kind of fit together. And if you don't have a Seed Center, you'll be very curious to uh, find someone who has one or to build one yourself. So who am I? Um, it's complicated. I created this open source software project in December of 2020 um, and very naively both named uh, the project Seed Signer and I adopted that as my kind of online persona. But me personally, um, I was a police officer for 15 years. I, I joke that I don't say that to make myself the most popular person in the room at a Bitcoin conference. Uh, but I had a very unique career path in that um, I was a digital forensic examiner for about 12 years of my career. So a guy working in a forensic lab taking apart phones and computers and trying to see if I could uh, recover evidence, uh, data that was uh, of evidentiary value in an investigation that either supported or refuted a prosecution. Uh, I also have a, a master's degree in organizational security management, so that gives me a little bit of insight into physical security as well as the, the forensic background, but also uh, kind of the information security threat landscape um, and a little bit of um, incident response. In terms of my Bitcoin story, I'm going to go into that, but I kind of think of uh, my Bitcoin story in two acts. So I first encountered Bitcoin in 2013 and I heard um, there's a Bitcoin educator called D++ here who talked about Bitcoin being a reflection of who you are. It's a mirror. And so in 2013, I was a young father who had spent way too much on a house and had three children. Um, and so I was actively looking for investable assets, and that's how I first looked at Bitcoin. And then as I'll, I'll talk more, uh, Bitcoin kind of changed uh, in, in terms of its importance and place in my life subsequently after that. Uh, I am currently a stay-at-home dad. I'm, I'm very blessed. Uh, and I say that just because uh, when you come to a, a conference like this, it can be very intimidating to meet people who are uh, working in startups or working in NGOs and... Um, I just like to share that, like, no matter what your personal situation, background, or skill set, we all have something to give to Bitcoin, and you, you don't have to be working in a startup or, you know, working in a foreign country spreading, you know, Bitcoin. We all have a part to play and a role. Um, casually mentioned, I'm a Christian, not trying to virtue signal with that, but one, one thing I love about the Bitcoin space is that people are not ashamed about talking about their faith. It's something that uh, is very refreshing about Bitcoin when we live in a very secular society. And Bitcoin itself, I, I think, can be an almost spiritual and meditative thing. And so it puts us in touch with our meaning and purpose as humans to some degree. I know that's a little bit esoteric, but um, I'll leave it at that. I love 3D printing. So I got my first 3D printer I don't know, seven or eight years ago. And there is something um, magical about taking an idea in your head and then being able to use a computer program to embody that virtually in three dimensions. And it's like you're a god of this little world and you have absolute control over every face and every angle and every curve. And you can create this like perfect object. When you go to print it, it doesn't always end up being that perfect object. But um, it's still very magical to me to be able to have an idea, to, to have a thing and then to be able to produce that thing like and hold it in your hands. It's, if you've never looked into it and you have like a little bit of an engineering mind, um, really interesting stuff. And then lastly, <clears throat> I am uh, a NIM. So that's why I'm rocking this awkward uh, uh, combination Justin Timberlake Unabomber uh, look here. Um, 
And originally, uh, I, I didn't put my name out in the Bitcoin ecosystem because I exited my law enforcement career about four or five years ago. And as I was coming out, I started to become more active in Bitcoin. And the investigations that I was working on were going to play out in courtrooms for a few years after me leaving. And I didn't want my involvement in the Bitcoin to interfere with any of my previous work. I didn't want to be labeled the Bitcoin guy by a de defense attorney in court. So that was originally why um, I didn't share my identity. But um, over time, I've come to really appreciate uh, NIM culture in Bitcoin and in the internet in general. I think it's important that the internet is not a, a KYC kind of environment, a papers please kind of environment. We don't have to provide our legal identity. Um, in terms of me being an M, I'm a little bit of a LARP. Uh, obviously, I'm not full GG here with you know a, a bodysuit or anything like that. After I go off stage, I'm going to take the sunglasses off, and you can come up and shake my hand, and I might even tell you my Christian name. So uh, I'm a NIM LARP to some degree, but it's I think it's important that we signal the importance of uh, it not being mandatory to disclose your identity, and that goes all the way back to in Bitcoin itself to Satoshi Nakamoto, who has you know, infinitely better OPSEC than I do. Um, but yeah, and what I, I, I love about that, um, the Guy Fox mask up there that I, I selected for the, uh, the presentation is that it's like very subtly in the shape of a heart. And a lot of people try to frame NIM culture or not providing your identity online as some sort of terrorist threat or you have some sort of malicious uh, plan. And it's really like, it's nothing like that. It, 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 it's, there's nothing um, inherently suspicious about wanting to keep your identity private. So uh, that's my uh, two cents on those things. So what am I going to talk about? Uh, first thing it's very important to understand, Bitcoin is not a, or not Bitcoin, Seed Center is not a company. So we are an open source software project. Um, we're a volunteer open source project. There's not really any underlying company. You don't have to buy anything from us. I'm not making... Any big announcements here? There's no big reveal about a new product or anything like that. Uh, this is just me as a Bitcoiner talking to a room full of other Bitcoiners. And that's partly so I don't get too nervous up here. But um, that's the way I'm approaching this. So I'm going to talk about a brief history of on-chain storage, cold storage, uh, how that's been done in the early, earlier days of Bitcoin, how it's evolved, and how we kind of approach it with the Seed Center project. Again, my uh, professional story and my Bitcoin rabbit hole journey um, and then I'm going to talk about some lessons that I think are relevant to cold storage and how cold storage can be approached that come from my unique background as a, um, a digital forensic practitioner. I think, you know, as I mentioned before, we all kind of might be intimidated that we don't have anything to offer the Bitcoin space. And as I came out of my law enforcement career, you know, it was kind of like, um, what could me, an ex-cop who's been doing digital forensics for the last... 12 years, what on earth could I contribute to Bitcoin? But as I started to think more about my own cold storage setup and what made me comfortable holding Bitcoin, uh, I think I found some insights that, you know, you don't have to be a, a forensic scientist to appreciate, and that'll make sense um, as we talk about them. We're going to talk a little bit about what's a seed signer, and then maybe a peek, uh, a peek at what's coming for cold storage maybe in the, the next five years or so. So first, what is cold storage? Um, cold storage is just keeping a secret. That's all it is. And a lot of people uh, identify their secret maybe as 12 or 24 words that the hardware wallet told you to write down when you first initialized it. And maybe there's some fine print on the card you wrote them on that says, do not share with anyone, do not photograph, do not you know, store on your phone, anything like that. Um, but what those 12 words are, for those who aren't familiar, those are human readable version of a master private key. And a master private key is just a relatively small amount of computer data, but it's very special computer data. It's computer data that um, ideally is very unique and that was captured from some little bit of randomness in the universe that only, hopefully, if, if you've done it right, hopefully only you we're a party to be either be able to create, ideally, or observe. So everyone here probably knows that you can do a, a bit lottery. You can pick seed words out of a hat, or you can roll dice to create a private key. Or in the case of a hardware wallet, not ideal, but um, it uses something called a random number generator. When you first initialize it, that comes up with 
its own little bit of randomness that it provides to you. So your private key is just this tiny little bit of randomness that shouldn't be predictable or reproducible by anyone else in the universe. And that's the secret that is basically cold storage, what you're, um, what you're tasked with preserving and not disclosing. So I'm going to break the rules and read this because um, this, you're never supposed to read off of slides, but oh well. So Bitcoin's use case as a decentralized, permissionless, seizure-resistant, dilution-resistant store of value is the real innovation. Um, Satoshi didn't start the Bitcoin project because he was having trouble moving uh, British pounds between PayPal and Venmo. The, the chancellor is on the, the brink. The, this is about hard money that cannot be inflated away by governments. Electronic payments, I think, are going to play a very important part in Bitcoin. And I, I love Lightning, and I love Lightning payments. But to access these more self-sovereign use cases for Bitcoin, where you can transact in a way that is very hard to censor, um, nobody can tell you how much money you can send somewhere or who you can or can't send it to. Uh, it's very diff If you set Bitcoin storage up in the right way, it's very seizure resistant. Um, you can also transact more privately using things like collaborative uh, transactions, um, join market, wasabi, that kind of stuff. To be able to do any of those things, you have to be able to do cold storage. So that's why cold storage is so important because it locks these, it un unlocks these uh, important use cases, I think, that are a big part of the Bitcoin ethos. So Bitcoin cold storage, epic one is what I call it. And uh, you probably heard or maybe even used Bitcoin Core. And Bitcoin Core is the reference client that was the first Bitcoin client that was published and used throughout Bitcoin in the early years. Um, it's still obviously the reference client that a lot of uh, the ecosystem operates by. Buried in the files that underlie Bitcoin Core is this file called a wallet.dat. Now in the early days, uh, wallet.dat was just a list of private keys. And these private keys were unrelated. It was literally just a, a laundry list of randomly created private keys that had associated public keys. And each of those private keys and public keys was used to track a chunk of Bitcoin. So if you wanted to back up your Bitcoin Core wallet, you would just make another copy of this wallet.dat. And if something happened to your laptop or your computer, um, with that wallet.dat file, you could recreate and have access to all of your funds uh, on a new system or if you try to recover it somewhere else. But... Because Bitcoin Core is obviously, uh, it creates the larger, Bitcoin D creates the larger Bitcoin network, it's inherently designed as an online program. So if your uh, uh, wallet.dat with your private keys in it is on a computer that's connected to the internet, even if you've taken the step of encrypting your wallet.dat, which, which is an option, but um, just by virtue of it being on an online computer, that is a hot wallet. Um, in information security, uh, generally hot means that something is on a device or being stored on a device or is exposed to a device that connects to the internet. Cold refers to more of uh, a, a device or storage medium where the internet, internet isn't present or uh, active. So early on, you know, Bitcoiners are smart people. They realized this was not an ideal situation. So um, uh, people created what are referred to as hardware wallets. An early one that I have a picture up here was a website called bitaddress.org that had a, corresponding, um, had a corresponding GitHub repo. And basically what it does for you, it's designed, if you're doing it the right way, is you run this website on a computer that's not connected to the internet, ideally with an operating system that never has and never will connect to the internet. And you can use it to generate these public-private key pairs that you can then uh, deposit Bitcoin to. And later on, when you want to spend it, recover it. Um, it's a little bit of a cumbersome process, but the, the security, the, the fundamental, <coughs> pardon me, security principle of it is uh, a sound one. But the problem with it is that it's very inconvenient. Um, you have all of these individual public-private key pairs that are printed on paper. And if you want to spend any of the Bitcoin from one of those kind of like Bitcoin tickets that you see uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, you have to sweep all of it because it's a... It's a raw public key, right? So if you are using that public key to, if you're, if you're redeeming that public key, which means you're um, activating it on a system that, that's exposed to the internet, it's now a hot wallet. So if you want to continue to do cold storage, you have to sweep that entire wallet and start again with a new one. So it's, it was um, sound security approach, but maybe not the most convenient user experience. Bam. 
treasure happens. So uh, this is what I call epic two of Bitcoin cold storage. And absolutely credit to the, the uh, guys at Trezor, they ushered it in with um, the introduction of that project, which ironically, I, I have no idea why, but originally was codenamed Piglet. So you see in the upper right-hand corner, that's a photo that I pulled from their website, which is an image of the original Trezor in a 3D printed case. And what was revolutionary about the Trezor is that they took this idea of wanting to have a private key in an offline environment and they created an offline execution environment that had you know, very simple basic functions. One was a digital storage media to store your private key and the other was to be able to connect to your computer with USB uh, connection and to be able to authorize Bitcoin transactions. As we'll talk about more, I don't think the USB connection is ideal but at the time, total respect to these guys, this was a huge step forward that made uh, self-custody much more approachable for the average Bitcoiner. Not a lot of people are going to set up an offline Linux computer uh, and boot it in, an, in, a, in a live environment um, and buy a, an inkjet printer that they're never going to use for anything else and print out these private keys. It's not going to happen. So um, because it was such a good idea, Trezor creating this device, uh, a, a bunch of other companies jumped in with their own kind of take on it. There was one called Keep Key that was basically a clone of Trezor early on. And then, of course, uh, the thumb drive looking device kind of in the middle there was an early version of Ledger called uh, HW1. And then, of course, in the lower right, that's the first version of the cold card, which cold card was a little bit of a step forward in that uh, the USB connection wasn't absolutely required eventually. Um, they did initiate a process where you could start moving uh, proposed Bitcoin transactions with micro SD, which is a little bit better approach. But the advances that made this Epic 2, which was such a leap forward for cold storage, possible are BIP32, which is hierarchical deterministic wallets. It's a big uh, computer science mouthful. But what that means is that instead of having in your wallet dot dat a bunch of unrelated private keys, now when you create a wallet, you create one master private key. And from that master private key, you can determine a predictable reproducible sequence of child private keys. That's why it's deterministic. So using the same approach with the same math and the same code, you should be able to derive uh, a identical set of private keys from that master private key every single time. So th what that enables is that um, in conjunction with BIP39, if you have your private key backed up, Similar to how I said with uh, the, the wallet.dad file, if you have that file, you can recover all your transactions. With this one master private key, regardless of how many subsequent transactions you've done, you should be able to recover your entire Bitcoin balance and wallet and be able to access funds. BIP39 is the mnemonic standard, and what it established was a list, an agreed upon, mutually agreed upon list of 2048 words that are a human readable version of your Bitcoin private key. So humans, you know, if you had to write down zeros and ones as a way of uh, preserving your private key, like we're really bad at writing down zeros and ones. You'll eventually get confused and mix up a couple and you could rug yourself trying to do that. So um, these BIP39 words are just a very human grokkable way of uh, recording a private key and being able to save it in an analog way. Um, that's one more important point to make is that all of these uh, devices um, were intended for use as private key storage because that's the most convenient way to access a private key is to have it on a digital device ready to use. Um, they borrowed technology that's also used in the mobile phone industry that keeps you know, the, the most private parts of, of the data on your phone secrets or your passwords and uh, other things like that. Phones have what's called a secure element in them and that's a specially engineered separate storage environment in uh, a computer or a phone that's designed to keep what's inside of it secret. So I call this kind of the original sin of hardware wallets is that um, they are digital storage devices and anyone who's been using computers for any amount of time understands that eventually every digital storage device unless they come up with something you know in the coming years that is you know, a leap ahead, every digital divorce, digital storage device eventually is going to fail. That's why when you initialize your hardware, you have to write down those words. 
So the original sin of hardware wallets, my humble opinion, is that um, you have a digital copy of your private key, but you also have the seed words written down that give you access to everything that the hardware wallet does. And when you're setting up this hardware wallet, what does it have you do? It has you enter you know, a, a four digit pin or something, something that is gonna provide some sort of access control to the device. And a lot of people uh, perceive that access control uh, to the hardware wallet is somehow also extending to the, the seed phrase that they've written down, which unless you're using also a BIP39 passphrase, which is a little bit deeper subject, um, most people have this hardware wallet that has reasonable degree of access control. You have to have a pin or a fingerprint or something to get access to it. But then they have this other thing that is, say, 12 words that also has access to all of their Bitcoin. And where does it make sense to store that? Do you store it, like, right with a hardware wallet? That, that doesn't make sense because the hardware wallet's, like, designed to protect what's written on the paper. So now do you take those 12 words and put them in a bank safe deposit box? Um, that's a better idea because if there's a fire at your home and your hardware wallet's destroyed, now you have a, a way to recover your funds that's somewhere else. But, you know, I, I'm a Bitcoiner, I'm suspicious. What if someone is uh, snooping in my safe deposit box and, you know, gets access to my 12 words? So this, especially for long-term cold storage, there's this dilemma of what do I do with the two copies of the private key that are an absolute necessity when you're using a hardware wallet. Just something to keep in mind uh, as I move forward here. So back to my professional story. Um, I, have a, <laughs> I have a bachelor's degree in English literature, of all things. Uh, I minored in philosophy in college. It was big into the humanities. And uh, after I graduated college, I did all sorts of random shit. I was a flight attendant in 2001. I was in the air on 9-11. That was an interesting experience. Um, and I just kind of bummed around for a few. I drove a Zamboni at an ice rink uh, and had all of these kind of unique experiences. But then... I got bit by the law enforcement bug, and while I was trying to figure out how to become a cop, I took a job at a local university, and one of the perks at the local university was that you could take classes while you're working there for free. So I took classes in management information systems, which is just, uh, it's like computer science, but not as technical, with more of a business sort of angle to it. So there's, uh, I took a couple classes in Java programming, systems analysis and design, database and design, basic networking, that sort of thing. Uh, but like I said, I had the law enforcement bugs, so after I finished that, uh, that certificate program, um, I figured out how to get accepted in the police academy, went through the police academy, got hired by a local police department, and I was a cop driving around in a cop car for a few years. You know, the jerk who pulls you over and writes you a ticket or who comes to your house when there's a fight or something like that. But very early on in my career, um, my supervisors knew that I had a little bit of a technical background, and um, there was a, a local uh, computer forensics task force or uh, crime lab or whatever you want to call it that was looking to add additional examiners. And so they sent me over there, asked me if I wanted to do it. Duh, of course, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, it's going to get me off out of the rain and I don't have to work weekends anymore. Like, that's amazing. So I go to the forensic lab. And as someone with a little bit more knowledge than the average person uh, in terms of technology, uh, you, you, it's immediately apparent that you have to up your game and learn a lot in a very short period of time there because you immediately start looking at evidence and that means anything that you work on could go to court which means that you could find yourself in front of a jury uh, trying to explain binary counting systems or uh, fat file systems or SQLite databases or how timestamp artifacts are stored or any of these kind of minutia in uh, digital forensics. So for the, the first few years, it was like drinking through the fire hose every day when I went to work, it was just like trying to absorb all of this information that I needed to be able to uh, competently do my job and represent the organization and, and wanted to do the exams with, you know, ac I don't want to send anybody to prison if they you know, shouldn't be there or they didn't do anything wrong. Um, so it was uh, a very rapid sort of learning period of my life, learning much more about um, uh, computer science, but from a different angle. So drinking from the fire hose, uh, and what I also became good at uh, with digital forensics was developing mental models. So if I'm presented with a 12 hard drive RAID storage array, I have to very quickly understand not just how RAIDs work, but what specific uh, RAID array you know, approach they're using, and how to recover that and logically reconstruct it, and then uh, how to search it and talk to other people about it. So 
I got really good at developing mental models that helped me understand, explain, and in some cases predict behaviors. It was, it, it's just a skill that's inherent to the, the job. And towards the end of my career, um, I'm, I'm an efficiency nut. I like to like do the most that I can with the little that I can. And so towards the end of my career, it was kind of this game um, to see how, how much casework I could get through. And so uh, towards the end of my career, um, I started getting access to even better training experiences. Um, in the United States, the Secret Service offers uh, a program called the National Computer Forensic Institute that's based out of Alabama. I was attending classes there and also came to help instruct classes there, served on their technical advisory board. Um, in the latter parts of my career, I was recognized by the United States Attorney's Office. Um, I, I just want to give the impression here, you know, I, I went through it, I got the t-shirt. Um, I was operating uh, at the kind of peak of my personal capacity in there, but the kind of dark side of my career is that most of my work involved crimes against children. So my salary was funded by a state grant that was aimed at child pornography and those who produce it, those who distribute it, and those who consume it. So much of my casework, like over 95% of my casework involved uh, crimes against children. And so as I was becoming more and more productive, uh, burnout creeped in and I was kind of looking for a way out, an escape into you know, some other career or something different. But back to my personal Bitcoin story. So I first heard about Bitcoin at the forensic lab. Um, there was a local high school kid who had, this is in 2012 or 2013, I'm not entirely sure which, but he'd gotten a very expensive uh, gaming computer for Christmas. He's a rich kid. And he was, instead of using this uh, really expensive gaming computer to play Quake or whatever the game at the time was, he was mining Bitcoin with the two GPUs in it, which back then you could very competitively mine Bitcoin with a couple of GPUs. You're not going to become a millionaire, but you could make some reasonably good money doing it. So he is mining Bitcoin, and then he goes on the dark net to the Silk Road, and he purchases um, small to medium quantities of marijuana that are shipped to his uh, home address from either within the United States or internationally. And then he breaks down the marijuana into smaller, um, smaller packages, takes it to school, and this kid is making uh, a heck of a side hustle selling weed at school. So of course, very like uh, entrepreneurial, industri industrious young man. But of course, eventually the, the teachers or the administrators find out and they call the police, and that's how his computer landed at our forensic lab wasn't my case. It was another guy who was uh, working on the kid's computer. And we're, you know, chatting by the, the water cooler one day. And he says, so I've got this case that involves this Bitcoin thing. And he starts to describe how the kid's buying the weed after he mines these Bitcoin. And I was really intrigued, um, just as a, partly as a, a forensic curiosity, like what is this thing, but partly just from a, a general curiosity, like what could these GPUs be doing that's providing value to some other entity that then enables him to receive these coins and what's all this compute for. If, you've, uh, if you're a little bit older, you may remember something called um, folding at home, which was a, a research that they used compute on people's home computers to try to fold proteins to discover cures for diseases. Or there was another one called search for extraterrestrial intelligence at home, where they would use your computer to analyze sounds from outer space to see if they could identify intelligence. And I thought maybe Bitcoin was something like that, or it was some sort of like distributed password cracking engine. Like I, I, I didn't know what it was. And so that's what sent me down the rabbit hole. And um, I joined Bitcoin Talk and started posting there, started being active on, on Reddit. And like, like I mentioned, um, Bitcoin is a re reflection of me at that time. Uh, I was looking for investments and I thought like, this seems innovative. It's probably going to go up in value. But the question first is, how can I get my hands on it? So I, I don't know if this is as much a thing these days, but back then everybody thought that mining was the way that you should, who's going to pay for Bitcoin? Like you should just mine the Bitcoin, buy a machine that literally prints this magic internet money and that's going to be the cheapest, best way to get it. Also at the time, uh, ASICs throughout 2013 were becoming uh, more available to consumers. And so I went through a period where I tried mining in my basement, I mined Bitcoin, and then when GPUs didn't work on Bitcoin, I mined all sorts of shit coins. And um, the game was kind of like, how much Bitcoin can I accumulate? I eventually, you know, a year later, shut the miners down because they were heating up our basement in the wintertime and consuming too much electricity. So then I thought, like, surely um, I can invest in these altcoins because 
how could they get it right with Bitcoin first? Bitcoin's not going to be the, the, the one that ultimately wins. And so started buying shit coins and trading those. And then like over time you realize maybe it is Bitcoin, but maybe I can get more Bitcoin by trading, you know, other assets. And so you, you go through, not everybody is going to go through this uh, as a Bitcoiner, but a lot of people go through these stages of Bitcoin. They say that uh, a smart man learns from his own mistakes and a wise man learns from other people's mistakes. Um, but I had to learn from my own mistakes. And finally, in 2014, 2015, 2016, it was like we're just in a bear market. Maybe people don't understand this technology and at some point it's going to go up again. So it's going to just settle in and ride the bear. So I mentioned before that I was uh, getting burned out with my my fiat job and I was looking for an exit. So at this time, Bitcoin is kind of, uh, I've been holding Bitcoin through a long bear market and Bitcoin is just approaching the point to where if I sold all of the Bitcoin and paid the taxes on it, I would legitimately be able to pay off the mortgage on our house and maybe look at a new career or be a stay-at-home dad or something like that. And been through a long bear market. So in early 2017, just as the price is coming up to like $2,200, it's at that threshold. What else is going on at this time? The fork wars. So um, I was utterly paranoid that, because they say you just hold, you know, hold all the chains and the chain that wins, you're invested in it. I thought that the fork wars were going to destroy the network effect that Bitcoin had garnered to that point. And so even if Bitcoin won, I wasn't sure what it was going to be worth on the other side. And I didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to live a debt-free life because some geeks were arguing about parameters and soft, software, i.e. The, the, the block size. So I had a lettuce hands day, and I remember it distinctly still at work. I left kind of in the middle of my work day, told my boss I was going home. I pulled all of my... Uh, the, the eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper that were storing my Bitcoin out of my underwear drawer and started uh, redeeming them on an exchange. And in that day, it was the most awkward liquidation of Bitcoin probably ever because there's probably uh, a dip on the chart of the, the exchange that I sold on that day because I was just markets. I didn't even sell smart, <laughs> like to prevent slippage. I was just dumping Bitcoin because I was just, had this anxiety built up in me. But... I also thought the anxiety after reflecting on it later was partly how I was holding the Bitcoin. It wasn't just me paranoid about the future of the network. It was me paranoid not having experienced an investment gain like that. Uh, am I going to be able to redeem these coins? How safely are they held? Has someone somehow been able to figure out the private key uh, because the tool that I used to create it was compromised? Like, is the Bitcoin really there? Can I still access it? Um, so I think that contributed to my sort of lettuce hands experience. So indeed... Um, you know, the, the fairy tale came true. I, I was able to start planning uh, my exit from digital forensic life. And uh, for the rest of 2017, I didn't want to think about or hear about Bitcoin at all because the effing price just kept going up and up and up. And it was like, how much more could I have sold the Bitcoin for? So I'm not thinking about Bitcoin actively for the rest of the year. But it's like, there's a picture from Godfather 3. Once you think they're out, they pull you right back in. So in in 2018 and 2019, I start paying attention to Bitcoin, but it's from a much more ideological perspective. I'm worried about the American debt. I'm worried about inflation. I'm worried about the kind of future that I'm going to leave to my children. So as I'm transitioning out of my career, I'm buying back less Bitcoin at higher prices. We all get Bitcoin at the price we deserve it at, and so I was getting it at the price I deserved it at. That's the, uh, the sad corn there. He's sad because there's much less of him, and it costs a lot more to acquire him. So um, as I'm stepping away from forensics, I'm rethinking my cold storage and I'm starting to think about uh, what sort of gleanings from my career in digital forensics maybe could help me become more comfortable with, uh, with storing Bitcoin. So first lesson, operation in isolation is important to keep private data private. In the forensic lab, we had an entirely separate network that was not connected to the internet. We obviously have evidence and we want to access it from multiple computers. But we operated parallel networks. So there's one, like in my office, I had one computer where I would do internet research and do my emailing and do you know, professional correspondence. And then I had other computers that were connected to our forensic that never touched the internet. If I wanted to install a new program on one of those computers, if I wanted to update Windows, whatever I wanted to do, it was sneaker net. I had to go to the internet connected computer, plug in a thumb drive, download the program, and then take it to the offline network because that 
network contains all sorts of evidence of crimes, contraband material, child pornography. We didn't want that to become in any way risk it being exposed to the internet, so we just didn't connect it to the, the internet. It was an offline network. Um, also, an illustration of this principle is when you're um, examining a mobile phone. So when you seize a mobile phone, if you're seizing it from someone who has any relative competence as an adversary, as soon as you get back to the police station, they're going to go straight to a computer and they're going to log into Google or they're going to log into Apple and say, my phone just got stolen, wipe all the data from it. And you're going to get back to the police station, you're going to open up your evidence bag and it's going to have an Apple logo on it or a Google logo and it's going to say, welcome to your new phone and you're going to be like, mother. So um, we were very fortunate in the forensic lab to have what's called a Faraday closet or a Faraday room. So it's a, it's a, a metal shielded room that you go into, it has a big door big metal door, kind of like a bank vault. And when you close that door, if you're looking at your cell phone, the bars just slowly disappear to zero because all of the network uh, signals are blocked by the metal shielding in the walls. And that's for two reasons. One, because of that uh, death from above that'll wipe the phone. And the other is because we don't want any new data to arrive on the phone. We don't want new, new calls coming in or new text messages coming in. We want to examine that as a more static piece of digital data that's not uh, having new types of evidence come in that might or might not be covered under our search warrant. And then lastly, um, in digital forensics, real quick, we use what's called a write blocking device. So if I'm going to acquire information from a USB connected uh, hard drive or a thumb drive, um, I connect it to a special device that's kind of an intermediary between my forensic computer and the evidence. And the whole point of that device is to make sure that you know, if I were to maliciously try to plant evidence on that device, I wouldn't be able to do it because the, the write blocker blocks writes, so it prevents uh, any sort of writes from happening to the device that's connected to it. So uh, lesson one, operation in isolation is essentially keeping things private. Two, it's possible to use uh, an electronic device and not leave any trace or any meaningful traces of what you've done. We leverage this in the forensic business using uh, forensic acquisition software. So if you have, as an example, uh, uh, a laptop and you want to acquire the data from the hard drive and the laptop. Some laptops are a big pain to take apart. Like you have to now access an NVMe drive that may involve removing the keyboard and you could possibly damage the computer. You don't want to do that. Or maybe someone has given you consent to search their computer and you don't want to be taking it apart in front of them because once you get the screwdriver out, they're going to say, whoa, whoa, whoa what are you doing? So um, computers have these acquisition tools. Um, Forensic examiners have these acquisition tools where you can boot the computer to an alternate operating system that is only running in RAM. So it's either on a, a thumb drive or it's on a, uh, a DVD um, that you've loaded in the computer. You boot it up into what's usually a Linux operating system and it is what's called a live CD. So it's operating entirely in memory. And you can do some cursory searches on their computer or you can get a full forensic image of the internal hard drive of the computer. Um, and when you power the computer off and either remove your DVD or disconnect the thumb drive. Uh, in the firmware, there might be some, you know, records that the computer was turned on, but as, in terms of the hard drive inside there, there's no record of anything that you did. There's no record of you copying data over or accessing certain files. So it's just this unique perspective that um, you can use a digital device and leave no trace. So that opens up some interesting opportunities with Bitcoin storage as I'll talk about more. Um, I had a very unique perspective in terms of mobile phones over the course of my digital forensic career. I watched cell phones become this awkward little flip thing that you'd flip open and press seven, you know, four times to produce a T, all the way up to the, um, like, basically supercomputers that we all carry in our pockets. So as phones were becoming more sophisticated, uh, they're very popular with consumers, but uh, the phone companies were having trouble making penetration into um, government organizations and into enterprise markets because the phones didn't have any sort of security mechanisms. And if people were going to be communicating about, you know, secret government things or private uh, corporate details, the phones had to have some sort of assurances that uh, the information on there was reasonably safe and couldn't just be gotten by anybody who got their hands on the phone. So Apple and Samsung and these other manufacturers started adding security features to phones. And what that resulted in was kind of a cat and mouse game between uh, people who try to get data off of phones and people who try to keep data safe on phones. So um, in the US in 2012, 2013, I think, uh, there was a terrorist attack in a city called San Bernardino. 
And after the attack, they'd gotten a phone from one of the people that was implicated in the attack, and there was supposedly information that was very important in the investigation on this phone. And they couldn't get into the phone because Apple had just, you know, executed some sort of security upgrade. So for two or three weeks in American Congress, there were calls in the House of Representatives and the Senate. There were all these, like, debates that we needed. The government needed back doors. We need ways to get into these phones. And then a couple weeks later, you know, a very smart Israeli company figured out how to get into that, that particular phone. And the whole discussion went away. So security... Um, is a cat and mouse game, and I got into a lot of phones. The phones that we carry around in our pockets, uh, the Apple and Samsung and the other manufacturers would like to lead us to believe that they're very secure, and in some ways they are, but the government also has a lot of tools to get into these phones. So there were a few phones I couldn't get into, but the grand majority of phones that I needed to get a data acquisition out of, I was able to get into because I had access to tools that three-letter government agencies in the United States use. Um, but, as I said, I worked with uh, child exploitation, and some of the more savvy uh, people who are active in that world will encrypt their uh, exploitative material using different encryption programs. And depending on which encryption program, if they picked a good encryption program and used a sufficiently uh, complex password, I wasn't getting into their stuff, and nobody in any of these three-letter agencies was getting into their stuff. They were relying on unsolvable math problems. And so what I want to in part to you is uh, these kind of secure elements. Don't want to trash talk any hardware wallet companies. They make a lot of sense in some Bitcoin storage use cases. But if you have adversaries that are skilled, I think we're eventually going to see more of these secure elements being exploited uh, as Bitcoin grows in value and as governments are more incentivized to get into hardware wallets that they uh, are able to get their hands on. I'll leave it at that. Last lesson learned, hide and seek is much harder when you don't know where to look. So multi-sig is an extreme asymmetric uh, advantage for the defender. I also, as a part of my law enforcement career, help people write search warrants and help people execute search warrants, which means I was the person who was going into a house with a team of people looking in underwear drawers and desk drawers and under couches looking for something as small as a micro SD card. Um, and as I started to wrap my head around multi-sig, uh, it was immensely powerful to me. And not just with government adversaries, but just from common you know, thieves who might be trying to steal your long-term Bitcoin savings. It gets ridiculously harder when the secrets to access your Bitcoin are not just stored in your home, but they're stored in unknown locations elsewhere that could be uh, across town, in another part of the country, or in another part of the world. So um, multi-sig is just a huge a huge um, asymmetric advantage that I think anybody who is um, setting up a long-term Bitcoin storage setup uh, should consider implementing. It's not as complicated as you think. So as I'm uh, studying these, kind of reflecting on this stuff, there were some advancements in Bitcoin cold storage. And I listened to a Stevan Lavera podcast where he was interviewing a, a guy called Michael Flaxman. Michael Flaxman wrote uh, several years ago this thing called the 10x Bitcoin Security Guide. It's in a GitHub repo. You can Google it. It actually still is very relevant. Um, that provides kind of these best uh, uh, tips for getting the most bang for your buck in terms of how you can optimize your security, set up and get the most benefit out of small things that you can do. And one of the things that he talked about was multi-sig, and another thing he talked about was Spectre Desktop, which was one of the early implementers of a multi-sig um, workflow that was accessible to average Bitcoiners with software that you could just download. Spectre Desktop also has a DIY uh, hardware wallet slash signing device called the Spectre DIY. And I was a little technical, I built one, and it had always made me uncomfortable plugging a hardware wallet into a computer because as a forensic practitioner, I know that things that you don't expect or even know can happen when you attach one USB device to another USB device. So I was never comfortable. If you can update the firmware over that connection, bad things can happen. Because um, I'm paranoid. I, I need to absolutely embrace that. But what the Spectre DIY does is it takes this sort of concept of separating the, com the, the computing device that interacts with the Bitcoin protocol and the separate computing device that interacts with your private keys and seeks to emphasize the separation between those two things. So on your laptop, you run Spectre Wallet, which communicates with the Bitcoin network, and then you can use the Spectre DIY device, and 
that interacts with your private keys and they communicate with one another through QR codes. This QR code thing is, is a very elegant solution to the, the air gapping kind of challenge because you don't want the two devices communicating via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth either because you can't audit that protocol. You also can't um, necessarily know when data is being exchanged or control when it's being exchanged. With the animated QR codes, you decide when information is related from one computer to the other. It's really hard to pack uh, a lot of information. There's th those QRs, so it's a very naturally constrained kind of communication protocol. And um, for me, it was just, like I said, a very elegant solution to this air gapping challenge. Um, the key advances, uh, CoboVault and Spectre DIY, I don't know which one of them came up with the QR code thing first. It may have been CoboVault and great for them if they did, but Spectre DIY was how I first interacted with it. So um, yeah, that's how I discovered it. But this Bitcoin Cold Storage Epic 3, what's, uh, what's making that possible? And that's the PSBT stack spec, which is a partially signed Bitcoin transaction. Um, and that is just basically like a draft Bitcoin transaction that doesn't have the signatures maybe yet to spend the money, but that's what you communicate to the device that talks to your private keys. So um, it's a much more elegant way to uh, keep your cold keys cold while still being able to have access to your funds. But I'm a cheapskate, like I said. So the Spectre DIY was great, but I started talking with Michael Flaxman privately as well, and he had this idea to use a Raspberry Pi to create a private key generating device. And the interesting thing about the specific version of the Raspberry Pi that he was uh, referencing is that it had no Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth, no NFC, no any kind of other uh, sort of wireless communication built into it. So it's this naturally very uh, enforced at the hardware level, isolated environment where you can feel confident creating a private key. And I thought, you know, what if I create this thing that creates private keys but I add a camera to it um, that basically turns it into the same feature set that's available within the Spectre DIY. Because it can both take in information through the camera and it can communicate with the outside world through those QR codes. So the Seed Signer is uh, a device that's just specially made to interact with your private keys. Um, air gapped, like I said, stateless. So our operating system, once you boot the device up, you can actually remove the memory card because the memory card, our software is loaded from the memory card into RAM, like with those forensic tools I, I, I referenced before. And so you can pull the memory card out and the, the device still continues to function absolutely normally and that's just to provide some enhanced assurances that your private key is not somehow leaking onto the memory card. Um, it really is that when you pull the power, data in RAM at uh, you know, a physical level is not stateful. So when you remove power, it resets to kind of a default natural state. The information that's stored there is just gone. Um, Seed Signer is totally open source. Uh, if you go to our GitHub repo, we tell you exactly what to buy. We have images to download the software. If you want to build the release code yourself, you can build your own release. You don't need to buy anything from us. Even the 3D printed enclosures that myself and others have come up with, it's all available free of charge. So no need to buy anything from us. Uh, Seed Signer, Bitcoin has given me a lot, so Seed Signer is kind of my love letter to the Bitcoin ecosystem and the Bitcoin community. Um, you can also build it privately, so when you buy a hardware wallet, you're landing yourself on an unknown list of Bitcoiners. The better companies will never leverage that information, they'll destroy it and not keep it. But as we've seen, some companies will send that uh, information out to marketing uh, email firms that you know, send you spam to try to convince you to buy other things. And so we're not a company, you build this privately, you don't have to interact with us at all. Um, you can build one yourself for about $40. We're Bitcoin only because that's important on its face. And uh, the initial versions of the software, so I, I'm not a coder, but I did write the original proof of concept, first two, three, four versions of the software. And I didn't even incorporate single sig into the first versions because I was so laser focused on multi-sig as, um, as uh, such a powerful tool. Um, so what makes this unique? Those QRs that I was talking about. So for use cases in parts of the world where people approach the internet with a phone as opposed to a laptop or a desktop computer, those QR codes work even better with mobile phones because mobile phones have better cameras. So um, a seed center will put cold storage into the hands of someone you know, who only interacts with Bitcoin and the internet through a mobile phone. Also this idea of statelessness, the, the hardware wallet that doesn't remember your private keys what that also enables is that you can use the device to manage multiple private keys. You can use it to manage maybe a single SIG wallet and then an entire multi-SIG quorum. So every time you pull the power, it's gonna forget all that you did. 
Also, I would never treat it like uh, a bank pen on a string, but if you have people in your life, friends, relatives, um, that you would like to share the device with, you want to set up cold storage and maybe they're really holding for the long term, they have no, ac no interest in accessing their coins for a few years, you can absolutely use a seed signer to help other people set up cold storage and when they want to access their coins, they can do that. Um, but what does it do? It's basically a harder wallet when a key's loaded on it. So you can use it to securely create uh, uh, private keys. You can introduce a private key that's from a different harder wallet. We comply with the 12 and the 24 word uh, bit 39 standard. So you can uh, create private keys with it. You can also set up the wallet on your internet connected phone or computer. You need to generate an extended public key to do that for people who are a little more technical. Um, so that's the second area of functionality. And then of course, what's the use of it all if you can't actually sign transactions? But you can very securely sign transactions with a high degree of assurance that your private key stays on the seed signer without being somehow communicated or transmitted to the, uh, the coordinator that's talking to the, the larger wireless network. So this is a hardware wallet that you can basically build yourself. Um, these, this is the, the parts that go into it. The green board on the left is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, version 0, which is just a smaller version of the Raspberry Pi that people use to build nodes. And we have a simple display and controls, a camera, a micro SD card, a USB cable, and if you so choose, you can print a 3D enclosure yourself, or maybe um, you know somebody with a 3D printer who could print one for you, or there are people out there who sell the enclosures. Um, the other part of the software that communicates with the Bitcoin network, these are the, the software um, these are the software programs that we work with on a laptop. There's, uh, of course, Spectre Desktop and Sparrow Wallet. And if, if it wasn't obvious, these programs, of course, leverage the screen of the computer as well as the webcam. So your computer has to have a webcam, but almost all computers do these days. Uh, and on the mobile side, Blue Wallet, Nunchuck, and a newer entrant called Keeper. So if I had told someone when I was uh, starting out on this that I was going to create a harder wallet that didn't remember your private keys, people would have laughed at me and thought I was crazy. Because the collective wisdom is that that's what a hardware wallet does. That's a, key, uh, that's a key part of the functionality is that it stores a digital copy of your private key. So this is a crazy untested idea. I've never started a FOSS project before. I'm not a programmer. Uh, I, I did take a couple classes in Java in 2002. <laughs> But um, I'm not a coder, so I had to binge watch Udemy videos on Python for a week before I, I had kind of the basic skills I needed to create the first proof of concepts of Seed Signer. Uh, fortunately, once I did that, people, other people recognized that maybe there's some merit to this idea, and people who are much better coders than me came in. I don't do much with the software these days. I'm more kind of the, the uh, coordinating, coordination point for the project to speak like this, as well as to help people who want to contribute find a way to contribute. Um, but fortunately for us, people are way better at program, programming than me came in, and they continue to come in. So we have kind of three core collaborators with the project um, that continue to add new features and refine uh, our software. But we also have other contributors. We have a guy from the Philippines who manages, uh, he's a web developer, and manages our presence at seedsigner.com. We have people that design enclosures. We have a, a, a project manager within the Bitcoin design community who donated his skills to us to help us become more organized and productive and to track our processes better. So um, we've been super blessed as a project to have people, other people uh, will get exposed to a seed signer, use the device, and there's something about it that really clicks with them and makes sense. So I'm actually here on stage talking to you too. That's maybe a, a sign that we're, we're getting some traction. But what is also uh, extremely validating is that some of the corporate wallets are starting to pioneer the features and the workflows that we have sought to prove out over time. We have a very active Telegram community um, and people come there and talk about different cold storage approaches and strategies. And the harder wallet companies, I mean, they're for-profit businesses. They want to give uh, their customers what they want and they recognize that we're doing something innovative with Seed Signer. Not really any of the ideas were ours to begin with, but what we've created is a very low cost, uh, high quality device that can help explore some of these workflows in terms of multi-sig being managed with a single device or air-gapped QRs or storing your seed phrase as a QR code. So Jade from uh, Blockstream has adopted basically our, our full feature set in a separate um, operating mode that I think they call QR mode that basically turns it into a seed signer where you can import keys, create keys, sign with keys, and when you remove power, they're supposed to not be 
any trace of them on the device. Um, CoinKite implemented what, what they call ephemeral seeds, which is uh, another computer science term basically for stateless. I think that was maybe so that it wouldn't be so obvious that they were adopting a feature that we had popularized. The uh, forthcoming Q1 that looks like a very interesting device, looks kind of like a BlackBerry and is going to uh, leverage these QR workflows, has that same ephemerality in the QR workflows. And uh, I put a kind of a funny tweet from Bitbox up there who um, also wanted to demonstrate that they could be used in a, a quote, stateless way. Because originally the, the Spectre DIY was stateless, but um, the, the lead engineer didn't actually see that as a feature. He saw it as a bug. Um, he, I, I found a tweet that he had sent out early on that said the Spectre DIY should be thought of more of as a toy than a serious device because it didn't have the, a secure place to uh, store your private key. And it, it's just a matter of perspective. It's, it's an amazing device and actually once seed signers started uh, embracing statelessness, they did as well. So th this device really does make sense. And one thing I didn't illustrate um, is that uh, What's so important about the stateless approach, because your key is not stored in the wallet, now that analog copy of your private key, if you put that on metal, that should be the only copy of that private key you ever have to worry about. So if you have a two of three, if you want to set up a two of three multi-sig with hardware wallets, you have six things you have to track. You have each of the three hardware wallets, and you have each of the three analog backups for the hardware wallets. With a stateless approach, in that same simple two of three, you only have three things you have to keep track of, and it's just the analog copies of the private key that make up the quorum. Um, if that wasn't clear, catch me afterwards and I'll, I'll explain it better. Peaking, I'm, I'm just coming up on time here, so I'm gonna rush through the rest. Peaking into the future, uh, time is the next dimension that's gonna be explored in cold storage. So these advanced scripting setups where maybe you can't even access your money for five years, you wanna prevent a lettuce hands experience, experience and make it so you can't even access your coins until a certain block. Or you have what's called a degrading multi-sig to where it might start out as a three of five, but in five years in case you lose some of the keys, maybe it's only two of five. Or in 10 years, um, Maybe uh, you've, you've passed on and your, your ancestors are going to be tried at accessing the funds, but they only have one of the keys. In 10 years, maybe just one of the keys. So this uh, kind of more advanced scripting that can do some very creative things with cold storage is, is I think, um, where the, the, the practices, best practices are headed, and we're looking to implement these uh, in Seed Center as well. So, woo. If you want to... Um, uh, interact with a project. We're at SeedSigner.com, at SeedSigner on Twitter. I'm SeedSigner on Telegram. I was super lucky that that was not a common word before we made it one, so I got to access the .com domain. Uh, check out our community. Check out our GitHub. Look at the website. If you have one, share it with other people. If you're a coder and you think it's interesting, uh, you know, get in touch with us. Start digging into the code. And I have a ton of thank yous. Uh, Alex McShane with BTC Inc. asked me to do this presentation and then gifted me another 45 minutes to talk with you people. So I appreciate your patience and your attention. Um, my two primary lead uh, uh, collaborators are Keith McKay and um, Newtonic, Nick, um, who, who have brought Seed Signer to the polished, amazing thing that it is these days. So glad seeing in the HRF, especially uh, CK, who um, uh, they've been very good to us. That's the only grant organization that, that has given us any, any serious support in terms of developing or rewarding our contributors. And then there's a bunch of uh, people on Twitter and people on Telegram who have done, like I said, a variety of things for the project, everything from actually contributing code to helping create steel plates for backing up seed phrases to graphic design to all sorts of things. So uh, I won't go through them explicitly, but you can see them. Thank you to all these people. And uh, lastly, thank you for everybody for listening. I'm going to be probably hanging out for a while in the, uh, the exhibition hall. I'll have a seed signer set up. If you're curious and you'd like to hold one and, and interact with it, absolutely. Final plug, uh, it is a DIY device. If you don't want anybody to know that you have one, go, go buy the parts and build it yourself. But to get me to events like this, I do sell kits. So uh, if you'd like an assembled device or you'd like all of the parts to take it home and put it together yourself, I have those kits available. That's what helped funds me coming to conferences like this as well as uh, supporting the project in general. So that is all I have. I'm one minute over. Apologies for that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 
thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee. A city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.